communist atheism has always been ugly, always been anti-beauty, always- Because it's anti-human. Well, I was gonna say, these things all work together. That's why we're having this conversation because these things all flow from each other. And so if you hate God, you will hate human beings and you'll hate beauty because you have a utilitarian, materialistic view of everything that says beauty is irrelevant. All we need is, you know, brutalist architecture, shelter, some food, some vodka, maybe some cigarettes. We don't need beauty. And that's contrary to what every human being knows innately. Precisely, Eric. And look, as you well know, um, the 20th century, we lived through some of the worst totalitarian movements that have ever existed. And one of the things that the Soviet Union did, the, um, the cultural revolution in China, was to destroy tradition and destroy the symbols of that tradition in the argument that a whole new world was gonna spring out of destruction, right? This is not the Christian worldview. The Christian worldview is, yes, of course, the world has fallen, but it can be redeemed through our cooperative work. And you don't have to destroy to redeem. Welcome to another edition of Socrates in the Studio. Um, Socrates in the Studio means there's no audience. So if you hear people laughing, it's your imagination. Uh, it's my privilege to have as my guest, someone I've interviewed before, but not uh, in the Socrates format, Margarita Mooney Suarez. Margarita, welcome. Thank you, Eric. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to talk to you about anything, but particularly about what we're going to talk about today. Um, you've put together a book called The Wounds of Beauty, The Wounds of Beauty, Seven Dialogues on Art and Education. Often Christians uh, bandy about the phrase, the good, the true, and the beautiful, but they rarely talk about the beautiful and beauty, uh, so I, I, I wanna ask the larger question, uh, w what does truth uh, have to do with beauty? Uh, what, what does beauty have to do with the good and the true? Um, but as we get to all that, why don't I start with you and ask you, uh, Margarita, how did you find your way into writing about these things? This book really emerged out of the COVID crisis. When suddenly classes at Princeton Theological Seminary were shut down, I had been reading C.S. Lewis's book, The Weight of Glory. It's a series of essays of orations. And one of my favorite quotes from Lewis is, I'm gonna paraphrase him here. If humans had postponed the search for beauty until we had perfect safety and security, the search never would have begun. And now, so- Now that, 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 I just, to, to in case people don't know, I think it was somebody asking him about, you know, how, how can we do these kinds of things during wartime? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we just focus on the war effort? And he basically says, no, these other things are vitally central. Precisely. He's delivering this as an oration at St. Mary the Virgin in Oxford, just as England is getting into World War II and he's speaking himself as a World War I veteran. So St. Mary's, Oxford, fall of 39, C.S. Lewis. That's right, delivers this oration, right? And part of the reason I wrote this book was that having spent most of my career in higher education, the word beauty practically never comes up. And I had begun this journey of my own to understand the different traditions of beauty and why it matters and how to bring beauty back into education. And during COVID, I actually thought this made it that much more urgent for me, precisely because people suddenly felt isolated, they felt on the edge of a precipice, and there can then be a temptation to despair. And so when I wrote about when I wrote this book and I did it as a series of dialogues, it's an invitation to people who may not know much about beauty at all to reconsider why beauty has been so central to the Christian tradition, why beauty is so central to the common good, and as you said, why we have this term or these, these three words we put together, truth, beauty, and goodness. We've all heard that, right? But most of us, myself included, with a degree from Yale and Princeton, I'd never taken a class that actually dealt with philosophy or theology of beauty. 
And now through writing this book and in the research I've done, I've realized that most of the way I've heard people talk about beauty is actually from a kind of critical theory point of view, a postmodern point of view, or, or a romantic point of view, which fails to actually get at the very central idea in Christianity that beauty is a property of being that allows us to participate in the divine. Now, I'm that sorry. sounds like a lot I'm of big sorry, words. What? I'm sorry. That's what? a lot of big beauty words. Beauty is a property of being. That's it is universal. Yeah. It is part of what makes us who we are. That we are called by something beautiful to enter into the divine life, which is self communicating. Of course, so this sounds like not, a lot of words. When but. we're talking about beauty, I just want to be clear. There's so many false ideas of beauty. That's right. Right. The most false. Uh, would would be, well, not the most false, maybe the most recent, the most shallow would be the idea that beauty has to do with like lip gloss and, you know, foundation. Uh, we're not talking about, you know, beauty tips because the, sometimes when you hear the word beauty, people go, uh, people go there, oh, beauty. Then we have the idea that you, you, you touched on a little bit, which we'll get into in the conversation, but a view that has kind of crept into the culture um, that beauty is like a dirty word that uh, like ugly is beauty or we're, we're going to propagandize ugly the ugly is beautiful and traditional standards of beauty uh, are somehow you know whatever you know plug in colonialist patriarchal or what, what, whatever it is so so it's interesting when you're talking about beauty how many different concepts there are about it um, but you particularly differentiate modern ideas, quote unquote, modern ideas of beauty with the classical and the Christian ideas of beauty. So that's ultimately how we're framing this. That's when you talk about beauty, you're talking about that kind of beauty or that idea. That's right, Eric. You're right that for a lot of people when they hear beauty, the first thing that comes to mind is something that's attractive or, or pleasurable. Now we can come back to that, but that's not actually the classical understanding of beauty. In my dialogue in the book with Peter Brown, an historian of late antiquity, who was also a biographer of St. Augustine, right? Most people are familiar with this idea from Augustine that his conversion to Christianity in part had something to do with beauty, right? What was this beauty to Augustine? And what, what Peter Brown makes so clear is that for the ancient world in which Augustine was educated, beauty was a human achievement. It was great architecture, it was big buildings. Um, but then Plato, classical Greek philosopher, had argued, no, no, it's not the building itself that's beautiful. It's the kind of muse, the, the spiritual being that that building directs us to. And you can kind of rise above the created world to the state of pure contemplation. Okay, now I need to slow you down because that was a lot of good stuff right there. You just, uh, you just said that... I mean, th this is this is a big idea, and this is the reason we're talking about beauty is because <laughs> you talk about beauty being skin deep or beauty being we're just the opposite, right? No, but C.S. Lewis, when he talks about beauty, he talks about looking at a landscape that is uh, beautiful, and it draw it wants to draw you into itself. That's right. You want to you want to become That's one right. with the beauty. So, so the bigger thing here, and again, we'll we'll, we'll be talking about this, but the idea is that. Beauty is not about the thing itself. It's about calling you beyond it to something heavenly, something, I, I mean, I guess that's what you, what you were just getting at somehow. Yes, though I would say that, again, using the example I was giving a moment ago of Augustine, the Christian understanding of beauty is that the material object itself does matter. Yes. Right? Because God yes. created. Okay, this nature. is not Platonic stuff. No. Here. This is this is That's right. Right. Incarnational. The thing material the thing matters. Matter matters. The thing matters. And beauty is not a human achievement. It's a co creation with God. But it should not be abstracted away from the material world because from a Christian viewpoint, that would be a kind of denial that material is good. Now, I think part of the reason people struggle with that yeah. is that the material world can also decay. It can distract us. It can pull us away. So people say, well, you know, 
But again, from the Christian point of view, you know, matter is created by God, but it does need to be redeemed and it does need to have the human touch in order to uplift it through grace. I, I, I have to say here, while we're kind of, you know, framing the whole conversation, it's interesting because you're Catholic. In the Catholic tradition, it seems to me that uh, Catholics have not erred in the way that many Protestant sects have erred with regard to beauty and seeing it only uh, as a temptation to folly or, or as somehow drawing us to look at, quote unquote, the world versus contemplating the divine. Th that's a false choice. And I, I, I think that it's interesting because you do have these traditions uh, of, of people who would eschew beauty as though it is fundamentally worldly in a bad sense. Mm. And that's more platonic idea, a more divided Gnostic idea that's not a biblical idea. Well, I would say I understand the concern from a Christian perspective that beauty can distract us from God, right? Yeah. Um, I teach at the Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, the walls of the church are white. There's no visual images. But what I've learned by teaching about the Christian tradition of beauty and then frankly rediscovering for myself the Catholic tradition was that, yeah, as Christians, we should be wary of the power of beauty to distract us from God. But we shouldn't also forget the incarnational message that matter is supposed to be redeemed. Now, for a bold statement here, Eric, I think what I'll say is that having taught about beauty now to mostly Protestant students who haven't ever thought about it, and frankly, most Catholics haven't, for the early church, there were a lot of debates about this, right? But finally, the early church decided that depicting Jesus Christ as a human being in painting and in art wasn't optional, it was mandatory because we have to remember the reality that the divine took on human flesh. Christianity is not an abstraction, it's a person. And so the, the concern about the adoration of images, despite what people think, Catholics don't adore images. Even if it's an image of Jesus, you're adoring, you're worshiping Jesus, and the image helps you do that. Similarly with images of the mother and child, right? Why in Christian art is there so much art of Mary with the child, right? Think of um, the great fresco by Frangelico of the Annunciation, where you don't even see the child other than in the womb, right? Or think of Mary in the Oron's position where Christ is pictured in a, in a almond inside of her womb. It's again, reminding us that our creator took on flesh through a woman. And so in Christian art, what I think is really important is to present Jesus Christ as a person and to present the faces of his faithful as people. And again, as I mentioned a moment ago, I started this book as COVID was launching. And what was one of the things that happened during COVID? We didn't encounter people with faces anymore. And I think although that may not be what comes to most people's mind when they think of beauty, right? A lot of modern art has moved away from depicting the human person as a person with a face. We present an abstraction. I mean, I was at an exhibit in London on St. Francis, and it was striking the difference between the art of St. Francis in nature, like right? Francis with the animals, versus a tree that represents St. Francis' love for nature. But guess what? There's no St. Francis anymore. It's just the nature. And so by taking the person out, what I think a lot of modern art has done is taken away the idea that God has given the human person a dignity that is unique within creation because we, because we have an intellect that allows us to co-create with God. Now, traditional Christian art has nature in it, but it's gotta have people, right? Um, because human beings uniquely have the image of God in their soul. So a lot is at stake for Christians to understand the tradition of beauty. And look, part of the reason I care about this is that my mother came to the United States from Cuba, right? So I grew up in a family that had lived through communist revolution. And when I visited Cuba with my mother after 40 years of not going back, 
everything I'd ever heard was that the people in Cuba don't want to talk to the Cubans who left because they abandoned them and they're the worms. That's literally what they're called, worms. And we go back to the village where my mom had grown up, where her family ran a sugar mill and they had built a church. And after 40 years of not hearing anything from my family, people started coming out of their homes and they had saved the baptismal card of a relative of ours. They had saved like a marriage picture. And then one guy said, come to my backyard, I wanna show you something. The church in the town, uh, like all churches in Cuba had been closed. This particular church had been turned into a movie theater and all the sacred objects were taken out. This man took us to his backyard and under a giant pile of wood, he took out of canvas that he had rolled up two eight foot by four foot stained glass windows that had been in that church. And he held on to them for 40 years in the hope that one day people could worship again in that church. Now again, he's not worshiping the image, but the image was central to turning his attention. Again, I use that word transcendent property of being, turning his attention to the origin of the universe that is unity and not conflict. Everything about Marxism is predicated on this idea that all, prog all progress comes through the conflict of opposites. This is not the Christian idea. The origin of reality is unity and beauty is disclosing that unity to us. And this man in Cuba knew that. Despite all the, all the ideology he was told, that the church wasn't on the side of the poor, that Catholics didn't care about the poor people, that all you need to do is produce enough sugar and we're all gonna be just doing fine. Well, guess what? People weren't producing sugar anymore when there was nothing to worship. See, this is so fascinating to me because people know this innately. You don't need to take a course. Uh, you, don't, you know this innately because you can't not know it because you are, whether you like it or don't, created in the image of God. So somehow innately, we perceive these things, we have a sense of these things. And it's also interesting as you talk about this, that communist atheism has always been ugly, always been anti-beauty, always- Because it's anti-human. Well, I was gonna say, these things all work together. That's why we're having this conversation because these things all flow from each other. And so if you hate God, you will hate human beings, and you'll hate beauty because you have a utilitarian, materialistic view of everything that says beauty is irrelevant. All we need is, you know, brutalist architecture, shelter, some food, some vodka, maybe some cigarettes. We don't need beauty. And that's contrary to what every human being knows innately. Precisely, Eric. And look, as you well know, um, the 20th century, we lived through some of the worst totalitarian movements that have ever existed. And one of the things that the Soviet Union did, the, um, the cultural revolution in China, was to destroy tradition and destroy the symbols of that tradition in the argument that a whole new world was gonna spring out of destruction, right? This is not the Christian worldview. The Christian worldview is, yes, of course, the world has fallen, but it can be redeemed through our cooperative work. And you don't have to destroy to redeem. But what worried me when COVID started was that I wanted Americans and the people reading my book and listening to the webinars that gave rise to this to realize that we have an important mission to witness to the reality that yes, the world has fallen, but it can be redeemed and we have to have hope and we have to keep creating beautiful things even in times of crisis because that's what's gonna pull us out of the crisis, right? What totalitarianism did was destroy everything beautiful, uphold everything utilitarian, but it destroyed people's hope. And without hope, people don't work anymore. They don't produce anymore. People who haven't visited a communist country and seen the complete economic standstill really cannot imagine that people don't do anything all actually, day long. Actually, you don't need to actually visit a communist country. You just need to go to the DMV. Pretty similar. Oh, that's a, that's nothing compared to what I've seen. But you, you can know, get, you can get a flavor um, of the hopelessness. My goodness. And the, the the brokenness. Right. But it's the same concept, yeah. And so, what I have tried to help people to understand, and it's also interesting, Eric. If you look at the biographies of a lot of people who thought beauty was um, 
a distraction or just part of capitalist domination, they couldn't help but want it a little bit for themselves, right? So even figures like Adorno, who most of you maybe have never heard of, but he's sort of the founder of critical theory, uh, Nietzsche, again, many of you have heard of, a nihilist, they all, you know, um, John Dewey, who most of you probably have never heard of, but has been more influential on you than you can imagine because he shaped our whole public school system. They all turned back to beauty after once having moved past it. But when they turned back to it, they refused to turn back to the description of beauty that I just said, which is that beauty is a transcendental, that it discloses the reality of God unto us. And what they end up doing is making beauty into an aesthetic god, right? That, oh, actually, what's great is once again the human achievement, a beautiful building or a beautiful painting. But there's no connection anymore between those paintings and the architecture and actually our destiny as human persons. So ironically, what we end up with is in the elite level in schools of art, people sneer at the word beauty. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, said, I said that in, oh. the, in the beginning and that that's, it's an interesting concept. They, they, they sneer at the word beauty, and sneer is, is really the only verb. They sneer at it, and they, they scorn it as effectively kitsch. Uh, anything that's attractive, uh, somehow they have been propagandized, and again, it's, this, it's really this, this Marxist atheistic view, uh, but, but they, 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 they've been told that anything appealing uh, oh, that that just appeals to the shallow masses. If you want to be sophisticated, you know, you d don't read anything that rhymes. Uh, don't 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 admire Norman Rockwell or anything visually at attractive. That's just all. You know, you 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 need to be looking at abstract art, or you need to be. And most uh, uh, educated people have allowed themselves to be propagandized toward that view of beauty, but most normal people innately resist it. They know that there's Precisely. something wrong. Precisely. That's why there's such a gap, right? That beauty, ironically, is for the masses. And this kind of, this anti-human beauty is really only held on to by the elites. So why do the totalitarians want to destroy beauty? Because they can't control it. And because it's bigger than them, right? So I do think we need to be worried that a lot of the elites in our country who make art don't actually believe in beauty. I think this is deeply problematic, but yet I'm hopeful because I've seen, as in that case in Cuba, that you can't take beauty out of the human heart. You cannot get rid of that desire. So what I'm hoping to do, what I'm trying to do through Scala is to help, and my, and my teaching and my writing, is to help people to understand that if you think that a beautiful painting is good and is helping you and is directing you somewhere, you're not crazy. And if you look at modern brutalist architecture and say, oh, gosh, I don't really get that, you're also not crazy, right? And I want people to understand that there's certainly important debates. But the most important reason I think I wrote this book, there's many important reasons, is that we have got to look at these old traditions because we're surrounded now by a digital culture. It's very deeply visual and people are being drawn by social media. Be, and I do think there's a lot of false images going around social media. There's a sense of a competition for attractiveness. This is not the beauty I'm talking about. And we can see by its effects, right? Does looking at beautiful images on social media make you happier? Not really. Does pornography make men happier? I don't think so. Why? Because it's false. And so there's a, there is a tempting allure to false forms of beauty. And so look, on the one hand, as we've said, beauty is for the masses and people ins instinctively get it. But it also does need to be educated and it does need to be formed, which is why classical civilization cared about it. It's why European civilization cared about it. It's why the founders of this country cared about it. And it's why it's currently being destroyed. Because when you destroy beauty, you destroy the image of God and man. You, uh, obviously the word image uh, is related to the word imagination, or rather the word imagination is related to the word image. You talk um, in various places about something called the graced imagination, because obviously people who are at war with God, people who are at war with human beings made in the image of God, 
they're at war, as you said, with beauty because it, 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 it somehow it competes with the totalitarian desire to subjugate people. It calls us out of ourselves. Imagination is part of that. Talk about the, what you call the graced imagination. 